Hi, I'm Edith Terry. I have the very great pleasure of welcoming Tony Miller to uh, this book launch at Asia Society in Hong Kong. Uh, last January, when Tony shared a copy of the manuscript with me, um, I had basically the same reaction as he describes his reaction to the first Lohan that he saw at the British Museum, which was shock and wonder. This is just such an amazing book. Subsequently, uh, uh, Graham Earnshaw, the publisher uh, of Earnshaw Books, uh, saw the manuscript too, and he had the identical reaction. We both love this book. Now, um, it, it, there are many reasons why I say it's a really, really good book, which isn't much of a review. But in the first place, it's, it's a fascinating whodunit but with multiple footnotes. You've never seen a whodunit that had as many footnotes as this book. Secondly, it's a great read. It's very, very accessible. And then thirdly, it brings up some major issues relating to heritage, to, uh, to where, where objects uh, out of history belong. So one of the, the context of this book is the enormous migration, the, I would say the forced migration of some of the greatest works of Chinese art into North American and European museums at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, um, many of you will have been to the Buddhist grottos of Dunhuang, of Yungang, of Longmen, and others across China, and you'll see these big patches of wall that are blank, where people like Langdon Warner, who was uh, one of the prototypes for the fictional character of Indiana Jones, came in, essentially hacked out the murals and the sculpture and uh, freezes anything they could get at uh, with local cooperation, packed it up in crates and sent it off to Beijing and then farther to North America and Europe. Now, this is not just a matter of, of uh, the distant past. Uh, ISIS and the Taliban both fi financed much of their, uh, much of their exploits uh, through, the, through the, uh, the black trade in, uh, in, in archaeological artifacts, similarly pulled out of the museums and uh, heritage sites of the Middle East. And it's absolutely par for the course in Asia. In 1990, when I was a correspondent, I uh, was taken by a friend, a, a young archaeologist and journalist, to a, uh, a closed site protected by the Ministry of Archaeology in Indonesia, um, a beautiful sacred mountain filled with uh, temples and and uh, archeolo archeological sites. And we spent the night there uh, at, on a hillside temple uh, overlooking a valley. And he had been there the previous month. And he was absolutely shocked because in that short period of time, someone had come in and hacked away a, a, a frieze uh, that was part of this temple. So this still happens. And it is uh, shocking. So let me stop there. I would say too many of you know Tony quite well, better than myself, for me to go through his life story. But just let's say that he was very, very successful as a public servant on Hong Kong's behalf from 1972 when he arrived in Hong Kong, straight out of school. He went to SOAS and studied Arabic to uh, 2007 when he retired. And he's had a second and parallel career that has shown even more brightly after he retired as a collector of Chinese antiquities. Um, he is best known for a collection of uh, white uh, unglazed uh, Jingdezhen sculptures uh, and has, ex has uh, put together uh, at least one exhibition and written many scholarly articles about that collection. Um, but he's also uh, one of three members of the, the premier society of 
collectors of Chinese antiquities really in the world, which is based here in Hong Kong, called the Minshu Society. He's also a past president of the Oriental Ceramic Society, which is where I know him best, although I have, we have crossed paths before. But with no more ado, let me hand it over to Tony. Thank you, Edith, for those flattering remarks. Uh, I'm half Irish, and so I was cheering this morning for a certain young lady. Let's hear it before I start for Hong Kong's Olympiads. <laughs> right on. And as you know, Edith, the Irish don't hold grudges for much more than 10 years, and I haven't forgiven you for a certain remark about a certain phrase I used as a t trade negotiator, but enough of that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, to those of you who are watching from overseas, a very big thank you. I'm sure that wherever you are, it's an ungodly hour. Um, this evening, I want to talk about, although the book title you've seen is The Missing Buddhas, I want to talk about a group of Lohan. Um, many of you I know will have visited the Metropolitan Museum in New York and have seen in the entrance to Gallery 2008, these two gentlemen contemplating the infinite in their rather different ways. I call them the, the younger and the elder monk. And they're part of a group of um, terracotta statues in the glaze which today we take for granted as a tang three-color glaze. But when they surfaced in the European art market just before the First World War, they caused a bit of a stir because in those days three-color glaze was a bit of a novelty. The experts knew about it from the Chinese and Japanese texts which they'd read, but real examples were fairly rare. They were just beginning to trickle through from the accidental excavation of Tang tombs that accompanied China's development of its railways. The younger of the pair was sold to the Metropolitan Museum shortly before the First World War, but it didn't arrive in New York, thanks to the First World War, until 1920. Curiously, the elder monk reached New York just before the First World War, but to the frustration of the Chinese dealer who was trying to sell it to the Met, the curators there apparently felt that they needed to get the younger monk installed first before they thought about buying a second one. Happy ending, both monks were eventually there. But this is a rare example. It's a rare example of C.T. Lu, that great fixer, dealer, um, let's leave it at that, uh, who was bettered on this occasion by one of his colleagues. And that colleague was a young German dealer called Friedrich Pazinski. It doesn't seem to work all the time. Yeah, before we get to Friedrich Pazinski, a few slides for context. Pazinski arrived in Beijing shortly after the last Qing emperor abdicated and the first provisional president was sworn in on the Valentine's Day of 1912. A little known fact is that all of those splendid decorations on the, whoops, where have we gone? All of those splendid decorations on the chest of the new president were actually designed by a Norwegian, General Johan Norman Wilhelm Munther. He also modeled them. He started, um, he started as a cavalryman in his native Norway, signed up with the Chinese Customs Service, was persuaded to leave that uniform for a military uniform, and displayed what was known as reckless courage on the battlefield, which is where he came to the future president's notice. He was also a collector. And at one stage, he was rumored to have two of the Lohan in his possession. That proved to be false. Another little known fact is that he's Alexander Grantham's stepfather. Another collector who was haunting Beijing in those days was Charles Freer, after whom a certain museum has been named since. And he, I think he made three visits to China and his last visit, he was introduced to an extraordinary character, a great Chinese connoisseur, Duanfang. 
who unusually was a Han Chinese bannerman. He was also a statesman and a reformer. Unfortunately, he came to an unhappy end. He was sent to Sichuan to put down one of the uprisings that occurred in the first decade, and mutinying troops took his head from his body. They then sent the headless corpse back to his family, who prevailed upon one of his friends, a Swede, Orba Kalbeck, to negotiate for the release of the head so that the body could be interred properly. He was successful. He went on to become a dealer in his own right. He was a railway engineer, but he changed trades. And he set up what was known as a syndicate, procuring and supplying Chinese antiquities for European royalty and aristocracy. This was not one of the things that he sold. This was the jewel in the crown of Duanfeng's collection. And when his family were running short of money, they decided they would sell it, and they sold it to the Met for 20 million pieces, sorry, t tails of silver, the equivalent in money of the day of about 100,000 US dollars. And I put it there just to remind us, um, Edith has, that the end of the 19th century was the great age of building museums in North America, but also in Europe. The Senushi and the Guimet in France came at the same time. And their curators, well-funded, looked around the world for things they wanted to buy to decorate their shelves. And since demand creates its own supply, the dealers descended upon Beijing in droves. Leading the pack was an arrogant young Japanese gentleman, Sadayiro Yamanaka. Here he is when he was older and more respectable. And here he is when he was raiding, God forbid him, the Tinungshan Shrine, which was looted shortly afterwards. He opened his stall in New York in 1895. Here, the gentleman on his right, your left, is, I think, Terasawa Shikanosuke, who has a prominent role in the strange tale which follows. Other dealers, George Crofts, English fur trader, turned dealer. He saw the railway excavations, he saw the pieces coming out of it, he changed trades. He was a great benefactor of the Royal Ontario Museum. Edgar Wach, German Parisian dealer, whose agent was in Beijing throughout this period. Friedrich Pasinski, our anti-hero. Mysteriously, no photograph has been found of him so far. And at the center of the web, C.T. Lu, the wheeler dealer that you're all familiar with. What do we know of Friedrich Pasinski, apart from the fact that he has no photograph? His most famous work is Jagdalf Gotha, Hunt for the Gods, which was his account of the search, his hunt, for the Lohans. He was an autodidact. He was born to a less than successful businessman in Berlin who had to take him out of high school and send him to work in a shop which specialized in antique books and prints. There he encountered the Japanese woodblock prints which were beginning to come into Europe. And he was so attracted by them that he taught himself Japanese. He taught himself Japanese. He went on to write the first serious book on the subject and a biography of Hokusai, the great block printer. That brought him to the attention of the director of the Bremen Museum, who recruited him and sent him to Japan to look for treasures for the Bremen Museum. He was apparently quite successful, and I suspect he made quite a lot of money on his own account too because as soon as he got back, he set himself up as an independent dealer. And very shortly after that, he headed east again and arrived in Beijing, where he had his first encounter with one of the Lohan. The dealers called him the priest. They introduced Pazinski to the priest. I think they wanted to recruit him to work with them. He had other ideas. He decided he would try and cut out the middlemen and tipped off by the young Japanese Terasawa, he went down to the Western tombs. Terasawa had told him that the statues had been found in caves surrounding the hills, sorry, in the hills surrounding the Western tombs. These were difficult times, so he went equipped with a rope, an axe, a photographer, and a loaded revolver. He didn't have a laissez passe from the German consulate. So he was not anxious to come close to Chinese officialdom. He took up residence in a monastery next to the western tombs.
and put it about that he was there for the good of his health. He was going hiking in the hills. The hills, in his account, are called the Achlohenberg, the Eight Lohan Mountain. And he did hike around them, and he found a temple, the Dragon Gate Temple, the Lungmunse, and he found a Guanyin shrine high in the ridge above the temple. And outside that Guanyin shrine, he found two inscriptions on stones and stelae. The first one linked the Dragon Gate Temple to a grotto further along the mountain range called San Zedong. But if you read through this, it's a bit like a sort of typical Shakespearean mise-en-scene. It sets the scene for what follows. The other steel had this rather curious sentence in it. All these Buddhas came from far away. And various scholars have puzzled over why Buddhas is used here where Lohan is used for the mountain. But this is where the Buddhas in the title of my book came from. He continues pretending to be a tourist. He visits the mausoleum for Yongjing. He notes, and the atmosphere in his account is absolutely spectacular, he notes the grinding poverty which has resulted from the money which no longer flows for the maintenance of the old tombs and for the construction of the Guangxu tomb which has stopped midway. He has trouble getting people to help him find what he wants to find, but ultimately he is directed, guided up to the Shan Zedong, the Samaka Grotto. But when he gets inside, he's a bit disappointed because that's what he finds, a sorry-looking altar upon which squat three roughly painted idols as in any simple village shrine. These are his photographs, his words, and clearly somebody had been there before him, no matter. Further along, he finds another cave, and a fragment of a Lohan. He's ecstatic. I have to say, however, that no Lohan statue in Three Color Glaze has so far surfaced which meets that description. There is one, however, which looks like this. This one was offered to him, but it was buried a long way away, so he never saw it. One with a beard bur buried at Baoding to the south. When he finally gets his Lesi Pasi, he goes and calls on the Chinese official in the district. This is the man he calls the commandant who was responsible for guarding the tombs. And he finds, contrary to his expectation, that it's, he's an affable, scholarly man. And yes, he complains about all of these dealers and their agents who've been scurrying around looking for valuables in the district. It's a big nuisance. And yes, by the way, he does have one statue which maybe Mr. Pazinski would like to see. And there it is its head leaning against the wall next to the torso, like the head of a man who has just been executed. You may recognize it. This is the older monk from the Met, who now has his head reattached. Pazinski, by this time, has decided he's not going to find anything that he can buy in Yixian. He's also convinced himself that the statues had been in the caves above Yixian, and that they'd probably been hidden there to save them from the hands of marauding barbarians. He goes back to Beijing, he gets hold of two of the Lohan, and he puts them on the Trans-Siberian, which is just getting into business, and has them transported to Europe. But he's beaten to the punch by Edgar Vork's agent, who in June 1913 has these two exhibited in the Senushi Museum without the bases that they're sitting on in those photographs. One is snapped up by the pen, and the other one goes to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It's November before Pazinski gets his two to market in Berlin. The one on the left, you'll recognize as the younger monk from the Met, and the one on the right, the priest, that goes to Harry Fould, a German telecoms entrepreneur, one of those unfortunate German Jews whose collections were confiscated by the Nazis. The priest eventually ended up in a museum in Berlin and was believed to have been destroyed during the Allied bombing of that, sitting at the end of, of that city at the end of the Second World War. Across the Channel in England, George Crofts, the fur trader turned dealer, has been busy. He's got two of the statues to London with his favorite contact, Samuel Marx, Frank and Sons. The British Museum buys this one, 
News by this time is buzzing around the curators in the world. And over in Toronto, Trick Curley at the ROM decides he wants one too. And he sends cables left, right, and center. And by the time he arrives in London, summer 1914, together with Sarah Thomas, the redoubtable heiress of the Dominion Tire Company, Samuel Marks and co. have this one waiting for him. I rather like the cowl. It's the only one of the set which has a cowl. And this one reminds me of a, the way an English tr cricketer drapes his jersey. So, by the time that fatal shot was fired in Sarajevo, six of these enormous statues, they're all life-size. They weigh about 200 kilo uh, kilos apiece. Six of them had surfaced in Europe. And a variety of dates had been suggested for them, from Tang through to Ming. This clearly irritated the great curator at the British Museum, Robert Lockhart Hobson. And he unleashed a magisterial rebuke, aimed, I think, at his colleague in Berlin, Otto Kummel. Yes, old boy, of course, on the basis of glaze, they could be either Tang or Ming, but, last sentence, the latter is practically ruled out by artistic considerations for there is no parallel in the conventionalized Ming statuary with such works as these. So there, um, you get the picture. But that sort of uh, slightly sniffy remark aside, he had one quite remarkable insight, which is this. You know, for a man who learned his trade with British arts and crafts pottery, he made a link through to the statuary, the statuary in Nara. Put together, you could see what he means. But how did he make that link? Now, these days, a couple, of a couple of clicks on Google, and we're away. But where had he seen enough of the Nara statuary, statuary to make that mark, uh, to make that link? If Hobson was happy with his Lohan, doubts were being raised across the Atlantic in Toronto. They weren't quite happy with the head and the fact that it seemed to be a bit loose on the neck and maybe perhaps it wasn't quite the same age as the body. And that sparked uh, some correspondence with Yamanaka and Sons in New York because they'd arranged the shipping. And you read the correspondence, it's clear that the manager in New York ducked for cover and he said, well, that's how we received it from Mr. C.T. Lou. Hold on a moment. They bought it from Edgar Walk in Paris, so how does C.T. Lou fit in? Well, there's a relationship that we hadn't come across before. No matter. The manager promises that he, next time he's in Beijing, which is, which is a month later, he will talk to Terasawa, which he does. And he comes back and he quotes Terasawa's account to the curators in Boston. And it worries them a little bit because it doesn't quite match Kozinski's story. C.T. Lou is called in and that silver-tongued devil convinces them that in fact these are mutually corroborating accounts and the curators are happy. And ever diplomatic, C.T. Lou arranges for the base to be reunited with the statue free of charge. Well, they might have been satisfied with C.T. Lou's explanation, but they were never quite comfortable with the head. And a few years later, they replaced it. <coughs> and I'm indebted to a Chinese scholar called Jin Shen for the anecdote that the man who modeled for the head was in fact a cook from Boston's Chinatown. Very handsome cook. New York. Here we introduce ourselves to the remarkable Sigisbert Chretien Bosch Reich. Gijus to his friends. He started as a Dutch businessman, decided that business was not his thing, became an impressionist painter, got interested in Japanese art, went to Japan, and somehow found his way to New York, where he became the first curator of the Far East collection in the Metropolitan Museum. He's a wonderfully meticulous man, and he did a tally. And his tally was, in all, 10 are known. Remember that Pazinski had Ach Lohenberg, the eighth Lohan mountain. No, we don't know who Bosch Wright spoke to. He obviously checked with all the dealers, and he worked out there were ten. He lists six of them, five of which you have seen, 
one of which we'll see in a moment, which is in a Japanese collection. And then he goes on to say that there are four which are in the hands of dealers or private collectors. Well, we know that Harry Fould has one in Berlin, and we know that C.T. Lou was trying to sell the older monk to the, the Met, but that still leaves two outstanding. Bosch writes knew about them, but he was too discreet to say where they were. Bear that in mind. He had a few other remarks to make. And the only one I take exception to is the one at the end, because although I agree the hands of the young monk in the Met are lovely, I think the hands of the one in the MFA Boston are actually better. This is the Lohan which was acquired by Terasawa Shikanosuke for Kujiro Matsukata, another unusual man. He was a graduate of Rutgers, New Jersey. He became the chairman of Kawasaki Shipping, and he was a collector of European art. In fact, something going wrong here. Here we go. His Western paintings became the core of the, that section of the National Gallery in Japan. He eventually parted company with the law, and he gave it to, or sold it to, the founder of the Seibu Group, Yasujiro Tatsumi, another interesting man. At one stage, he was the speaker of the Japanese diet. And his successors, his descendants, have installed that statue in the Sezon Museum of Modern Art in Kerubizawa. Back to, Bo back to Bosch writes. He noted that some of the heads were non-original. Well, there's three of the non-original heads. He noted that they were all, to some extent, damaged goods, which was interesting. But then he had this to say, and again, we don't know who he spoke to, but there were also a great many small fragments, several hands and feet, and baskets full of broken pieces. So that's damage on a pretty serious scale. But where were they? Which brings us to Larry Sickman. This is Lawrence Sickman shopping for bargains for the Nelson Atkins, which would open its doors. This is Kansas City, which opened its doors in 1934. And boy, did he find some bargains in C.T. Lu's gallery in Beijing, starting with this one. This wonderful wooden Guan Yin from the Liao dynasty. It has to be one of the great sculptors of the world. And it's here, not because it has anything to do with this story, but because I think it's drop-dead gorgeous. In the same gallery, he found Lohan number nine. If you look very closely, you'll find that there is quite a lot of reconstructive surgery that's been done to this one. And about, this, about the time I got to see this one, I was beginning to think that there was more than one question to this puzzle. I call it the five-part riddle. Where were they made? When were they made? Whence did they come? Why had nobody seen them before? And I think that's one of the more significant questions. These are beautiful statues. Why are they unrecorded in Chinese texts? Why have none of the scholar officials recommended people to go and visit them? And why not a full set of 16 or 18? Bosch writes have made the point, counting all of the fragments and the feet and hands in the baskets, that this is probably a set of 18. Well, the curators and scholars that first came across them in the beginning of the, beginning of the 20th century focused largely on dating, because Pazinski had provided them with a plausible provenance. These were statues which had been hidden in the caves to keep them out of the hands of barbarians, and then they had somehow been lost to human memory. You get it. It's a very convenient story. Hobson said Tang made the link to the Nara school. Riedermeister in Berlin made a connection to some Liao pottery shards he found in Jahol. Alan Priest casually booted it back to the Ming. William Young, the pioneer of scientific appraisal, rather more seriously said, no, they are Tang. Basil Gray, the expert in Middle Eastern pottery, who also got interested in Chinese pottery, said Liao, not on the basis of any technical merit, but on the basis of style. And he's the first one to pin that down. And he made the point that he thought, and this was not a popular point at the time, that Tang style did not die with the Tang. It was carried forward by other people. In particular, he thought it was Liao. Now, who were the Liao? There were 
at least three major tribal groupings of nomadic tribes that were nibbling away at the borders of China, northern China, at this time, when the Tang dynasty was in decline. There were the Tanguts, who became the Sisha. There were the Khitan, who became the Liao. And there were the Jurchen, who became the Jin. And the Jin were the successor to the Liao dynasty. At one point, the Liao came as far south as the northern Song capital in Kaifeng, and then withdrew. But for most of the two centuries of uneasy peace between the two, the boundary was roughly from the neck of the Gulf uh, east-west, about 150 miles south of Beijing. Those who favoured a Liao dating for the Lohan had one difficulty, and that was that for most Western scholars, these tribes were basically barbarians. Even Reichar and Fairbank are a bit dismissive. They put the word barbarian in their text, if you look at the book, in quotation marks. But they're still dismissive, which I think is unfair. When you think about it, the Liao had a key role to play in the revival of Buddhism after the, um, the great pogroms, of the, the great persecutions of the late Tang. But they also had a role in the decorative arts, which was not widely recognized at the time. The first person to take up Basil Gray's point that maybe Tang style had been carried forward was Oswald Siren, who did a very dense analysis of this particular bust. The first time I saw this bust in the atrium of the Rietberg Museum in Zurich, I thought it was something the Romans had left behind. But in fact, it came from Northwest Herbay. And again, he thinks, well, maybe this is Tang realism carried forward by other people. And he referenced this dated piece, a marble Lohan from Herbei, which is in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and is dated 1158. And another one in San Francisco, dated 1180. Again, marble, again, realistic. Since then, other pieces have come to light. These stone, stoneware structures, sorry, stoneware sculptures were unearthed in Inner Mongolia. And extraordinary vivid features, very realistic. And some of you may make a link between this face and those, that, un, that incomplete set of lacquered wood heads which are scattered around um, the North American museums. These two are in the Nelson Atkins Museum. Extraordinary realism, but more than that, somehow the artist has captured the, the inner spiritual struggle. But it was left to Marion Gridley, who basically set the record straight and said, yes, the Liao might have been nomads, but they weren't uncultured or uncivilized. And they were very interested in absorbing Chinese culture, interested to the extent that they would be happy to borrow and hire Chinese artists and artisans. And one example which came to light in 1983 is the kiln at Chuan Wu, just outside Beijing in the Western Hills. The name Chuan comes from the famous kilns in Dingzhou, south of the border in what was then land governed by the Northern Song. So the Liao had either kidnapped or resettled, depending on your <laughs> perception, a group of potters and set them up just outside Beijing to work for them. When they excavated the site, they came across these. They're half life-size bodhisattvas. <coughs> As you can see, they're also three-color glaze. And that got the academics thinking quite hard about maybe just possibly the Lohan were made at this kiln or somewhere nearby. And there was a definite pickup in speed after a rather slow 70 years of not very much study. Suddenly people get interested. And for the first time, thermoluminescence tests are done at the pen and then the Met. And they give a scientific underpinning to the thought that maybe these were definitely Liao and came from that sort of a kiln. And then there's three surprises which happen one after the other. First, Director Zhang Hongyin, the director of the archaeological bureau in Yixian, where Pazinski said he explored the hills and caves, did the first field work in 80 years. 
two remarkable things. First of all, he couldn't find any shards in the caves dated to earlier than the Ming. And second, although he found some of the inscriptions that Pazinski mentions in his account, he couldn't find the two key ones, which I put on the screen earlier. Surprise number two. Lohan number 10 turns up in Paris. And Hong Kong's great collector, Ti Ti Che, is persuaded to buy it. Anecdotally, he then encountered problems getting an export license and very graciously donated it to the Musée Guimet. A little later, the newly appointed curator of the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Mir Maria Menshikova, opened a long-locked storeroom door and found an unlabeled sackcloth on the floor. And guess what? It wasn't destroyed in Berlin. It was nicked. These developments sparked a certain amount of new theorizing about the law Hon. Going back to 1984, Lawrence Sigman had said, no, these weren't statues which were hidden in the caves. These were statues which were made for the caves because it was a great pilgrimage site. Um, I have no idea whether he had actually visited the site, but there is absolutely no trace on the ground um, which suggests that very many pilgrims went anywhere near Yixian. Richard Smithies, <coughs> a very gifted amateur historian who's done most of the spade work on, in the last few decades on this subject, theorized that, in fact, the statues were made further south in Daiyun, and they were made for uh, one of the monasteries in Wutaishan. Jacques Gier, having taken into his arms the 10th Lohan, resurrected an idea first put about by Riedemeister that maybe Pazinski confused two place names, which are pronounced the same, but the Chinese character is different in the first character, and that perhaps they were actually from one Fort Hung. Again, recent uh, fieldwork by Chinese scholars has not found any evidence of any association with the cult of the Lohan, but be that as it may. 2011, Derek Gilman takes a punt at Changla Temple, which was near to the Resounding Halls Grotto in the south. And when I first heard that lecture online, um, I was really quite taken by it, because it's a sort of hidden in plain sight theory. The pilgrims who went to the grottos to see the great statues within the mountain were so focused on getting into the mountain that they probably missed these humble pottery statues in the temple where they overnighted on the way or on the way out. But two years later, Derek changed his mind and he read a brilliant essay. It's a fantastic evocation of time and place. It's absolutely brilliant. And he plumbed this time for the temple of the celebration of longevity in Beijing. And he tied the, uh, the the firing of these beautiful statues to a period when the successor di dynasty to the Liao, the Jin, was spending huge sums of money on their new capital, Zhongda, which is present-day Beijing. 2016, Dr. Eileen Xu follows Director Zhang, takes two visits to Yixian, walks the ground, clambers up the hills, goes into the caves, and just like Director Zhang, she cannot find anything earlier than the Ming, nor can she find the two key inscriptions. But she's convinced that the statues must therefore come from the Ming. I throw this map in just to illustrate one point. Yizhou, the place where the western tombs are, is about 100 kilometers southwest of Beijing, about the same distance from the Lungchuanwu kilns. Several of the theories which we just went through extend that envelope by four or five hundred kilometers. Think about the logistics of moving 200 kilogram fragile earthenware statues for four or five hundred kilometers. Not easy, even on a good day. Fortunately, two very brave curators, Maria Menshikova at the Hermitage, Jacques Gier at the Guimet 
volunteered to subject samples from their two statues to serious scientific, independent scientific study. This was led by Nigel Wood with Chinese and other specialists in the team and they proved to their own satisfaction that the clay from those statues came from exactly the same place and it's a rare deposit of a very special type of clay close to the kilns at Long Chuan Wu. And it's totally unlike clay from any other kiln nearby or further south. So they pulled the envelope back to the center again. However, the theories, they differ in some of the detail. They do agree on one particular point. And that point is that, with the possible exception of Jacques Jay, all of them accept Pazinski's story that the statues were in the cave, either placed there or hidden there, and damaged when they were retrieved by local bandits who pulled them out of the caves sub rosa and tried to get them down the hill but dropped a few of them on the way. And they believe that or accept that despite the fact that recent field work has found neither the two key inscriptions nor any shards dated earlier, datable earlier than the Ming. So I come back to my five-part riddle. When? Well, consensus minus one says Liao. Nigel Wood and the team confirmed more or less that the statues came from a kiln near or at Long Chan Wu. Going down to the bottom, why had nobody noticed them before? Well, if that's where they were made. They were in enemy territory for two, three hundred years. They were in the Liao lands. So ordinary Chinese scholar officials of the Northern Sung were not able to go across that border except on very special diplomatic missions. So there weren't any scholar officials doing tourism in the north. So they didn't see them. Why not a full set? Well, look at any the history of any temple in the Beijing region and you'll probably come across the word earthquake. Halls collapsed and had to be rebuilt with a monotonous regularity. Sometimes they were bigger earthquakes, sometimes smaller, but there were quite a few over time. And I think the challenge in looking at this group of statues is to ignore all of that and say, okay, well, where is there a site which meets the following criteria? It's associated with the cult of the Lohan. It's merited or benefited from imperial largesse. And it's not too far from the kiln to make the business of moving these huge statues too difficult. There are some clues. Pazinski mentions dealers. It seems fairly clear that the dealers were working together at some point in the process. Pazinski is very angry with Terasawa, probably because he realized that Terasawa had set him on, sent him on a wild goose chase down to the Western tombs. But he does have the good grace to admit that Terasawa was the first to spot the value of these statues. In their reply to the museum in Boston, Yamanaka's manager let slip the fact that Terasawa had told him the statues actually came from a temple, not a cave. Terasawa is also quoted as saying they had to move them a quite a long distance and makes reference to the fact that several of them were broken already and that some bits had to be left behind because they were too damn heavy to move. I think at this point I should come clean. I think for a, a century or so, Friedrich Pazinski has conned us all. He created a very plausible provenance for these statues. And everybody's believed it because it was convenient. But rather like the legends of uh, John le Carre's spies, he's relied on a plethora of circumstantial evidence to disguise a single key untruth. And the key untruth is that Pazinski didn't see any Lohan statues in Yisan or in the, the Yaman when he met the commandant. He saw those statues in the workshops of the dealers in Beijing. His 
the text of his account is riddled with inconsistencies, and you'll have to read the book to see them all, but two key bits. One is that he claimed, right to the end of his life, he claimed he was the only person who had all of the inscriptions. He didn't share them with anybody, and they haven't been found since he died. He took no photographs of the inscriptions. He took no photographs of the things he claimed he saw in Yixian. The photographs he has are the photographs of the two that he sold. And the killer, from my point of view, is that the name of the mountain, the Eight Lohan Mountain, does not appear in any recognizable form in any Chinese gazetteer of that period or earlier, nor does it, does it appear on any map. On the stelae, it appears as Ermoshan, White Cloud Mountain, or similar. It was our friend Friedrich Pazinski who christened the mountain Eight Lohan Mountain. Why eight, not 18? Who knows? But it was his name, not a Chinese name. When I started looking for a temple to match the criteria I've just described, like Derek Gilman, I was attracted by temples within Beijing itself, but I soon realized that that didn't square with Teresawa's reference to distance. And so I began looking in the Western Hills. Um, this is Beijing over here, Western Hills. This is the river, the Yongding River. And that little island in the middle, the Lungchuanwu kilns are just about there. And I first looked at the the gaggle of temples on the northeastern bank. Uh, this is where the, the Batachu, the, the eight great sites are. But going through the archives, I couldn't find anything which suggested even a close match to what I was looking for. So I looked to the, the south, and there you can see two very ancient temples, the Tanjusa and the Jetasa. The Tanjusa is the temple of the streams and the mulberry. It's famous for its springs, where yet I see the ordination temple is famous for its ancient pines. Interestingly, uh, Tanjusi was where Kublai Khan's sister became a nun. And uh, as you can see, they're both reasonably convenient to the, the river, and these days reasonably convenient to the railways. This, this is a, a map from about 1922, but those railway links were already there when the events of this talk took place. Um, I was struggling with these two temples when I came across two rather unusual texts. One was a Japanese tour guide uh, from 1910, and it included extensive excerpts from Qing scholar official diaries, which were basically advertising the advantages of touring the two temples, stopping one night at one, one night at the other, hiking all the way around. It was obviously aimed at other scholar officials and possibly students for the imperial exams when they weren't swatting for the exams. And it recommended both the temples and it recommended visiting the extensive caves which riddled some of the mountains, including their various stalagmites and stalactites shaped like dragons and all the rest of it. Um, the other one, written by Lieutenant Fritz Jobst and illustrated by him with photographs, he was the dolmetscher, the, in, the interpreter of a company of uh, German soldiers with the East Asian Occupation Brigade. And they were invited to stay at the, uh, the ordination temple, the Jetaisa, by Pu Wei, the grandson of the great um, Qing statesman, uh, Prince Kung, who had retired there when he fell out of favor with the Dowager Empress. And Lieutenant Jobs was no mean linguist. He was also curious. And with time on his hands, he hiked the hills and he wandered the temple and he drew plans of the temple and he talked to the monks and the abbot. I think he said there were 30-odd monks in residence at the time. And he transcribed, with their help, he transcribed some of the stelae. Between these two documents, a really quite interesting history emerges. This is his temple, Jobs's, uh, sorry, Jobs's photograph of the temple. The history is thus. The temple dates from the 7th century, from the Sui dynasty. It was badly knocked about during the persecutions of the late Tang. And then in the middle of the 11th century, um, a determined young abbot by the name of Fa Jun uh, 
appears and decides that this is where he's going to make his stand. And he attracts the attention of the Daozong Emperor, the Liao Emperor at the time, who was a fervent, devout Buddhist. And he provides a certain amount of money towards the restoration of the temple. He also provides, he gifts, a sutra written in his own hand to the temple. And this is deemed to lift the temple to the leadership of the revival movement. The good abbot spends the money wisely and he builds a five meter high three tier ordination altar which becomes the primus inter pares, the first amongst equal of the three great ordination altars of the time, the other two being in Hangzhou and Quanzhou. The ordination terrace is a good 150 meters long. Those are the ancient pines along it. And although I know that Lohans were normally accommodated in the Lohan Hall and there is certainly a Lohan Hall of sufficient size still there in the temple. In my imagination, I sometimes think about the 18 Lohan paraded along this wonderful terrace. Oh, by the way, that's... Oh, wrong one. That little terrace stupa is where the abbot Fajum's remains are. But this, rather like in Europe with the Jesuits, this is where the stormtroopers of the revival were trained and ordained. It is most definitely a temple with close associations with the Lohan, because Fajun was the leader of the uh, Vinaya, the, the Lu sect, the protectors of the law. And that's what the Lohan have always been. They have been the protectors of the canon. Bosch, as I say, mapped the area. The Tanjusu is over here on this range, and the Jetaisu is about there on this range. It's about 15 kilometers from the railway at the, just above the Marco Polo Bridge. It's 11 kilometers on the flat and four uphill, so it's accessible. In the middle here, um, E.G. Hubbard noted in 1922 that there's a path that runs along the top of the ridge. He called it a Via Sacra. It leads from the ordination temple right to the highest point of the ridge, and it passes several smaller shrines along the way. And this is an enlargement of Yosmak. This is the ordination temple. You see the path goes along here. Halfway along, he has what he calls a, a Hulun temple. This is frustrating. Hmm? Oh dear, oh dear. Battery must be dead. There we go. Oop. This is the Holon Temple. And when he saw it, it had the same plaque above the entrance, the Guangong Cave. He translated this as the, the God of War. But when he went inside, and the, the cave extends a good half a kilometer into the mountain, he was a bit surprised to find not stalagmites and stalactites, but a large statue of the Buddha on a plinth and arrayed along the sides of the mountain or the, the tunnel um, in niche carved into the, the rock, 18 life-sized lohans. Unfortunately, he doesn't tell us what they were made of, but they were certainly there. The missing link in this story is Terasawa. Let us suppose that Lieutenant Jobs' recollection is accurate, that he saw the Lohan here. When did Terasawa see them? Why was he there? Well, the answer to that is really quite simple. Puwei, the grandson of the statesman Prince Gong, eventually sided with the royalist group in the struggle for the succession. And he needed to raise some money in a hurry, so he decided to sell his grandfather's great collection. And some of you will know that that collection was sold largely in New York. And the man he contracted to sell it for him was Yamanaka, 
Yamanaka's man on the ground was Terasawa. He would have been responsible for all of the inventory and packing, and no doubt had to get the occasional signature, sort out the paperwork. Almost certainly he would have had to visit Jietaisa to secure that documentation, probably more than once. And being a curious and commercially minded fellow, uh, no doubt he looked around to see what else he could lift. More politely, my answers to the five riddles are when, I think the statues were almost certainly fired in the Daozong rain at the Longchuan Wu kiln. They were a, an imperial gift to the ordination temple that was the center of the Buddhist revival. They went unremarked because they were in lands beyond the pale. They were in Liao land, they were in enemy territory. And by the time that normal Chinese scholar officials could tour the country more freely, they'd already been so damaged in an earthquake that they had been moved off center stage and packed away. We know that they'd been repaired quite early on in their lives um, because the damage is so obvious. And uh, Bosch Wright noted that the manner of the repair of the heads was probably either Yun or Ming because he'd seen similar repairs elsewhere. The only person who could verify any of that is probably the abbot of the ordination temple. There he is pictured in 1922. And since I started with a, a younger and an older monk, I thought I'd finish with it just for fun. It's not much older. But I'll finish with, uh, in fairness, I'll finish with Friedrich Pazinski's words. I have wound my way through a jungle of lies and I'm on the track of only half the truth. Nobody gets to know the whole truth in China. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Is this on? Yes, okay. Um, well, let me start by taking um, the moderator's privilege to ask a question. But in fact, uh, the question uh, really comes from an, a book review that someone in the audience wrote and published a few days ago, um, Juan Jose Morales. So uh, it's a beautiful review in the Asian Review of Books. Um, but he concludes by, by uh, disputing one of Tony's uh, points, which is really a plea for these uh, treasures that, that were lifted uh, from China during a period of turbulence to go back, to go back home, particularly to the grottos where they came, they came from. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Morales uh, argues that these museums have done a, a good job. They've done their job in taking care of these, uh, of these treasures, and the past is past. So in a sense, I want to bounce this off both Tony and uh, Jose, who's sitting in the audience. But let's start with Tony, and then if you don't mind, uh, we could make this into more of a debate. So I don't want to frame your question uh, badly. You might like to elaborate on it, but first. Do you want to bring on the boxing gloves or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't think we disagree very much. Um, at the end of the book, I have a, um, a reference to something that Michael Ondaatje wrote about the Tin Long Shan the scene of what he called a perfect crime. Um, and you know, I'm perfectly aware that this is a sensitive subject. I'm perfectly aware that UNESCO has been grappling with it for years and making rather limited progress, more progress in terms of protecting stuff which hasn't been looted rather than the return of any artifacts which may have disappeared in the past. Um, but I make a distinction in that chapter between 
what I would call sacred sites and other antiquities. Um, yeah, we all we all know about um, uh, you know, the, the treasures that have been looted during times of war. We we all know about the uh, the horses on Saint Mark's, which Napoleon decided he wanted to decorate in Paris. Eventually, he was persuaded to send them back to Vienna. But as far as I know, nobody's ever suggested that they go back to Constantinople, which is where the last crusade looted them from when it was still a Christian city. Um, you know, fancy art has a historic habit of moving around quite a lot. Uh, but, but I do make a distinction between places which are sacred and other types of antiquity. And I think the crimes which were committed the sacrileges which were committed in the grottos are um, exiguous. Um, and I think there is a, c a case can be made for their return. Um, I don't think you can make the same case for things which were filched from a palace during a war or whatever. But you know, how would Italians and Catholics feel if the Pieta was suddenly wrested out of St. Peter's and all of the, the marble carvings around the colonnaded uh, outside the, the Vatican. Um, the grottos were sacred places in somebody's faith, and yet they were looted. I don't think it matters very much whether they were looted by native Chinese or foreigners who went in there. Um, they were responding to a demand for these things. Uh, given that you can now reproduce this sort of thing in three dimensions with relative ease. Where is the case for keeping the original in a museum? I just don't see it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, taking this point out of, uh, or single out this point, uh, it will misrepresent the book that is about the romance of Chinese art. It's refreshing because it's about the love of art, the meaning of art and it's a work of research, but it's uh, very well told, which is also rare, so it's fast-paced account, is really very enjoyable, is uh, for me like a, like a classic, like uh, the old books we used to read and because we love art. I think maybe I prefer not to go too long in, the, in, this, in this topic or, or to single out this topic, but just to remember uh, an essay by Simone Leys, and it's, a, it's an experience that everyone coming to China will have, that is, it is difficult to find the remains of such a long, rich uh, civilization and heritage, particularly for Europeans, and that this uh, neglect and distraction has been done by the Chinese themselves. So. It's a very complex, complex matter. I invite to read this article, and uh, this leads, Simon Leis leads to other, much more scholarly articles, and I will leave it here. Thank you. Well, I, I would just add, add to that, that in terms of um, preserving, uh, doing their job of preserving uh, antiquities, I'm not so sure that the, um, uh, the Curator Lodge at the Museum of Fine Arts uh, in Boston made the right choice uh, to have uh, to replace the head of of the uh, of his Lohan with the a sculpture of of a uh, Chinese cook from from Boston's Chinatown. Um, but uh, it, it is a very complex argument. Um, and and I uh, I am sorry to put you on the spot, um, but it's the the digital the fact that that uh, that museums are going digital and sharing their collections globally uh, that way I think is it does give a different perspective on that question of where does great art belong. So. Um, I haven't seen any questions from uh, our online audience, um, but one, so 
I'm turning to you, but if, um, if you don't move fast, I'll ask another question, which is, I was fascinated by your uh, historical revisionism with uh, the art and culture of the Liao dynasty. So um, when I studied Chinese history, uh, the, the Liao, the Jin, they're just kind of out there. They were an, un, an unfortunate uh, ha happenstance in Chinese history. Um, and yet, the way you tell their story actually illuminates the Liao art that I have seen, particularly Liao Jade, um, which is that there's something very romantic, very flamboyant about it. Um, and you, so what, can you explain why you think the Liao are special in that way? I think I should start by thanking my beloved wife who is sitting there in the front row, <coughs> nudging because she persuaded me to watch a TV series recently called Yin Wan Toy, which was set in the Liao dynasty. Uh, it was riveting stuff. Um, but to go back to your question, uh, I think they are special. And uh, I'll be frank, I knew very little about them or the Jin before I started getting into this subject. Um, but I had come across odd bits of uh, Liao ceramic and pottery. And they are different. Um, you can see that they have uh, a mainstream Chinese kiln origin. And then they do odd things. You know, um, and those odd things are a bit closer to Tang uh, predecessors. So you know, a chicken's head in the middle of a, the neck of a jug. But then they exaggerate it. Um, the rim of uh, a vase, which instead of being just an inverted cone, it suddenly develops into sort of peaks and curved troughs. Um, and the realism. Uh, the one, one piece which perhaps illustrates innovation is that what's sometimes called the saddle flask that was actually first rendered by Liao artists. It wasn't rendered by other Chinese artists. Those, sa those saddle flasks start with the, with the Liao. Um, I haven't really got into that subject yet, but I have a nasty feeling that one of these days I'm going to annoy the OCS by talking about Liao pottery. <laughs> what I do say, though, is that their, their sculpture is extraordinary. And I showed you several examples tonight. Um, I'd never come across it before. But that, that realism, coupled with the extraordinary inner struggle which you see on the faces of the Lohan, um, that's remarkable. And of course, the drop dead, gorgeous Guan Yin. Um, uh, any hands? Um, uh, if not, I'll go on to another question. Uh, Tony, you're best known for your collection of white, unglazed uh, Jing De Jun uh, sculpture. And I wondered if there was a connection between uh, your fascination with the first Lohan that you saw at the British Museum and what that, what that journey, what the journey that that led to, um, and the Jing De Jun uh, carved ware. Um, just as a coda to that, Again, when I studied Chinese history and Chinese art history way back when, um, this sort of uh, there was there was a distinction between high art and low art, and I almost want to say that despite their mastery, because of the material, uh, which is low fired low fired clay, and and uh, and low fired glazes. Th these beautiful Lohan would have been considered low art, and so not the, the uh, center of attention. So just is there a connection uh, between your interest in uh, the Jing, Jidun, Jing De Jun uh, sculptures and your curiosity about the Lohan? That makes me think a bit. Sorry, that makes me think quite a lot. Um, I think... Uh, both Najing and myself like carved things, whether it's tiny carved jades or gilt wood or whatever. Um, and I did get into the 
the carved um, Jingdezhen desk pieces, um, partly because they were carved. But what fascinated me more about them was that these were not pieces made for the palace. They were commissioned by private scholars. They were made in private kilns. And the potters that made them signed their names. And when I got interested in it, what fascinated me most of all was that nobody had bothered to try and find out anything about the potters. Um, and it's that human side of the kilns which continues to fascinate me. Yeah. Everybody knows there are three great reigns that produce some fabulous high-class ceramics for the palace. But the private kilns in different periods also produced some extraordinary stuff. Now, who were the potters who did this? In the case of the Lohan, I'll be honest, I turned around the British Museum and the hairs on my forearms went vertical when I felt this man staring at me across a thousand years. And it was a while before I realized that he was looking through me at something way beyond me. Uh, and I was just gobsmacked. Yeah. This, this was an extraordinary sculptor in anyone's language and it, I think it's one of those pieces that speaks across. I, mean, I think the British Museum one is exceptional but it, it speaks across time and space and cultures. Um, but having got over the initial shock, the question which I kept coming back to was, well, who on earth made these? Who were these men? Where did they come from? <laughs> That's the theme. Um, uh, well, just, just continuing uh, along on that, uh, uh, I've already asked you, and you said you didn't know exactly what had happened to the head, the decapitated head of the Indo-European looking figure, the bearded man with the gap tooth that was <laughs> put aside in favor of the uh, cook from China, Boston Chinatown. But you pick out three heads in the book that are, and you showed the, you showed the slides that you said are not original. Now the one at the at the Royal Ontario Museum, I think, is really, really shockingly uh, mismatched. He has kind of a pointy head, and even though the the, the cape, this is the one with the uh, cape thrown sort of thrown over his shoulder. Um, it, even with that, it, it just looks all wrong to me. Um, but the one in the Cezanne uh, collection in Japan. Uh, the the monk that is slightly tilted to one side as though his his, his uh, he's he has some sort of cramps uh, that one doesn't look too bad and the Indo-European one I think is a much better fit than uh, than the one that was substituted so uh, have they all been tested well I really want to know what happened to the Indo-European head which to me, again, it, ha it feels authentic. Uh, uh, who was it, uh, Lodge? Uh, the curator said that it was made of red clay rather than the mixed red and white clay that, uh, that, that the body was made of. So that convinced him it was wrong. But is there more research to be done on these figures? Uh, there's lots more research to be done. I mean, I, I don't think I've done very much more in the book than try and prize people away from what I call the Pazinski myth. Um, I mean, I may be proved totally wrong about the ordination temple. Maybe a steel will be unearthed at some other temple which tells us they were somewhere else. But that's for a, another younger, better qualified person to look at. For the, the one in the Royal Ontario Museum, uh, it was during Lodge's time that they began to worry about the the age of the head. I don't know for certain that it was he who commissioned the sculpting of another head, um, but I believe the original is still with the Royal Ontario Museum. And I, I think you're right. Um, uh, when the statues of the Lohan were made in the early, time, the early part of the uh, Buddhism in China, um, it was not uncommon to have an Indo-European looking head or face uh, because these were monks that came from the subcontinent. Um, my, and this is purely speculative, my assumption is that quite early on there was some kind of earthquake which knocked the heads off quite a few of these lovely statues 
And the monks scrabbled around to try and find replacements. Well, maybe they had a handy one somewhere, which was here suit, and they put that one on. And they asked the kilns down at Lung Chuan Wu to produce some other stuff, and they came out a funny black color. But I think that's probably quite early on in the life of the, the Lohans, and that was the best they could do. At some point, they obviously decided that the statues were beyond repair, that they didn't have a respectable set of 18 that they could face the world with. But they didn't want to let them all go, so they put them into store. Well, it was only in 2015 that the, that the first uh, carbon dating tests were done, and only of two, is that correct? Uh, I think it was in the 90s that the first carbon dating was done. I don't know whether anybody else has done any since, but I don't think so. Um, the, the two courageous curators who did submit their heads for further testing were looking at the composition of the clay rather than the, uh, the age of the clay. Yeah. Is there more to be done? Oh, yes. What, what's next for the uh, Lohan story? Do you, uh, should we have an international uh, council on, uh, on the dating and, uh, and provenance of the Lohan? Or is, is it kind of a, uh, a, a subject that has already played out? Uh, museums are happy, curators are happy, art historians are happy. Um, I... I used the word somewhere in the, the book, the uh, controversy. Uh, and I think there may be some pushback in some quarters. Um, uh, I hope I haven't offended anybody in what I've written. Um, but uh, we all know that provenance is a sensitive subject. And sometimes just uh, pretending that a provenance is a good provenance is a an easier way to live. Uh, I may have set the cat amongst the pigeons, so you know, in my case I will light the blue touch paper and retire to a safe distance. <laughs> One of the things uh, that I really enjoyed about the book was your bringing of this cast of characters to life, particularly Przinsky, who just we don't even have a photo of him, even though he went in, took photos. He had a Chinese photographer with him, which makes it even stranger that he didn't take pictures of the Stelle. Uh, maybe the Chinese photographer couldn't get all of his gear up to the, the highest grotto. But he was an am amazing character. Uh, his, I would say that, uh, speaking as a, a journalist, that one, one reason his narrative had so much power was that the, his uh, Hunt for the Gods, which you reproduce in the Smithies translation at the, in an annex to the book, is just really good reading. <laughs> it's a great story. And when you have a great story, you don't, you know, it, it takes a lot to, to sort of dislodge that. So how did you... How did you go about piecing together uh, this, the personality and the history of this strange person? Uh, I had a lot of help uh, from all sorts of people. Um, there's a great uh, German librarian, um, Valraven, Hut uh, Kuppen Valraven, who's retired now, but I think he still chairs the ISBN Council. And uh, he put together Pazinski's papers uh, after his death. Um, and when I couldn't find a photograph, I wrote to him and said, did he have one? He said, no. Um, but um, bits of his history had been pieced together. Uh, he got into Chinese porcelain in a big way as well. It's little known, but he, he wrote four articles on categorization of Chinese ceramics, which appeared in the Burlington magazine back in the 1912-13 period. After the First World, sorry, during the First World War, the German intelligence services recruited him, and he left in a hurry after the First World War, went back into dealing. But he, as uh, Juan knows, he joined with other artists in uh, forming one of the very lively um, arts groups in pre-Second World War Germany. 
but he was not in sympathy with the National Socialist Party. And with a friend, he exited Germany through Switzerland to Mallorca and then Spain and eventually migrated to um, Argentina, which is where he eventually died. But uh, I don't think there were any adventures of the sort which uh, he described um, around the Western tombs. He republished that article in a, uh, a book of other travels in China, and he was remarkable. You think about how convenient it is now to buzz around China, COVID permitting. Um, he went to a lot of quite out of the way places, knowing almost nothing about the country. He was adventurous. He was also very secretive. <laughs> um, I've tried to piece him together, but there are lots of missing pieces. And there's not a lot of third party commentary except about his secretiveness as a dealer. Fascinating. Um, well, we have a question from um, our online audience uh, from Robert. Is this uh, Robert uh, Dillman, uh, perhaps? Anyway, from Robert. Uh, he thanks you for the story and asks um, if it was a tradition during the likely time of manufacture of the Lohan uh, to make bundles of similar statues, or were these unique? In other words, were there duplicates? Uh, it, was this a factory production like the, the terracotta warriors um, in Xi'an? Um, very good question, and thank you for it. Um, a point that I missed when I was talking is that one of the first things that uh, Hobson at the British Museum commented on was that these were not tomb figures. They were not made in molds. These were sculpted from life, sculpted. Uh, he did a technical analysis. Um, he, he, was, he was hugely impressed by these um, figures because he knew that technically it was very difficult to produce anything that big without it shrinking in the kiln. And various people apart from Hobson have since taken them apart. They were created by, the bodies were created by putting together several slabs with vents in them so that the steam could escape. And they were built around um, metal rods to support them during the firing process. Um, and then obviously glazed. But look at the heads and the hands and the feet. Well, they're not molded. They're sculpted by somebody who knew what they were doing. Uh, were any others produced? There must have been you know, sculptures of that size. There must have been a pretty significant failure rate. Uh, some of them must have collapsed when they were fired. But were, was there an attempt to make a, you know, sets of 18 so that other people could have them? No, I don't think so. It was an imperial commission, get me 18 lovely Lohans and destroy the ones which don't make it through the kiln. Interesting. Um, well, you know, one of the things that I wondered about looking at the uh, at the Lohan in the in the Japanese collection, the Saison collection, um, who is slightly leaning, uh, and maybe you would know as a ceramics uh, specialist, um, could that have been a, a slight failure of the uh, internal scaffolding? In other words, a slight melting, and they but they were able to uh, rescue it. Um, I I suspect you're right. I, I fascinated that you used the word cramps earlier on and uh, in my less reverent moments I thought that yes he appears to be either easing a cramp or maybe there's a metabolic event. Well it's, it's just a you know maybe centimeters uh, of a lean it's not a, a leaning tower of pizza lean. You, you, no matter how you fiddle with your um, photo editing on the computer you, you can't make it sit straight <laughs> it's definitely leaning. Um, so, uh, I'm going to pr uh, put pressure on the audience. Uh, questions? Hi, this is Bill Mack from Cishan Monastery. Um, thank you very much for the fascinating talk. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first one about the title of your book. And I know that you made a disclaimer in your uh, introduction saying that this book is not about missing Buddhas, but because uh, Lohan is unfamiliar. Um, to uh, English-speaking uh, readers. I wonder if you could say a few more words uh, about your choice. Um, 
Uh, the second one is um, connected to this first one, the, the idea that these are Lohans rather than Buddhas uh, or um, even Bodhisattvas. Um, do you think that these account for the rather capricious replacement of heads and uh, changing part and, and so on? Um, I'm asking um, this because in the Tsitra Monastery collection, we also have a Vajrapani, the guardian, and that I believe came from the Yamanaka uh, um, collection and has a replacement. So the head does not match the body. And it's it always a little bit of a, an annoyance um, to me that things such as this uh, happens. Um, what's your thought on, on this? Take your second question first. Um, well, congratulations on that extraordinary collection that you have in the museum. But, um, heads have this unfortunate uh, habit of falling off. Uh, the, the neck is the weak point for statues, and it, it's, it's a universal <laughs> phenomenon. But at the time they fall off, the people who originally commissioned them may not be around, and they may not have the funds to have something appropriate put on top, and I suspect that's what happened in the, uh, the case of these 18 Lohan. By the time their heads fell off, the monks did the best they could, but they couldn't find anything more suitable. Um, on the title of the book, uh, you're quite right to uh, mention my disclaimer. Um, I suspect that when um, Pazinski wrote his extraordinary tale and he put in this puzzling, all of these Buddhas came from far away, he had his eye on his customers or his potential customers. And probably not one in a hundred people in Europe would have known what a Lohan was. So if he'd put these Lohan came from a far away, um, it would have passed over their heads. So he put Buddhas because that might have get their attention. And I shamelessly did the same thing with the, the title of the book. If I was able to publish the book in Chinese, I would change the title. Tony, thank you for a brilliant uh, speech. Um, you talked about this uh, incredibly gifted sculptor who created your experience at the British Museum um, and your difficulty in finding much about the sculptor. One of the things that's always fascinated me <coughs> is the uh, celebrity artists from um, 14th, 15th century Europe. Um, compared to the difficulty, very often in Asia, of finding anything out about the um, sculptor who created this uh, incredible result. Can you speculate a little bit about who he might have been and what he might have been and where he acquired his skills and whether he was in fact celebrated uh, uh, in his day, but where we fail to find any trace of him? That is asking me to be very speculative. Um, the tradition of the imperial kilns across China, and that clearly carried over into the Liao, was that pieces made for the emperor were made by anonymous artists. If they carried any identification, it would be the identification of the, um, the emperor of the day, which is why I was fascinated by the desk pieces with their signatures on them. Um, I suspect in this case, um, he was one of the very gifted potter artist who was kidnapped or otherwise encouraged to leave the Longchuan kiln in Dingzhou. And as you know, there are some remarkable examples of pottery from those kilns. Um, and that um, he, like other artists, whether it's in um, sculpting marble or in lacquering wood, was given a freer reign under the Liao and simply excelled given that independence. He was asked to produce something sculpted from life rather than something which was somehow stylized. And he went for it. All of the original heads are lifelike and they, are, they all have an extraordinary character to them. Who he was, 
Lord only knows, but you know, thank goodness somebody found them and was able to, quote, bring them back to life. You know, as, as kind of a follow-up to that, or as a sidelight, uh, I, I was fascinated by the way that uh, artisans were considered uh, national assets, in a sense. So they were captured and taken, but they were valued. And uh, uh, the essentially, uh, I'm, uh, the uh, pottery tradition in Kyushu in Japan was started much the same way. One of the two uh, Japanese invasions of the Korean Peninsula brought back a group of, of potters and set them up in a, uh, a tiny little, a, a village in a tiny bay, which they controlled the access to. They kept it under, under lock and key. So, uh, so just the notion that whether they had, whether, whether they were auteurs and signed their works or not, they were considered highly valuable is to me is is uh, appeal, appealing as a, a creative person uh, myself, um, but going back to the Japanese connection, uh, I first came across uh, these very very realistic uh, uh, bodhisattvas and lohans in the Japanese context, uh, particularly in Kyoto, where that's almost and Nara, where that's a dominant style and has uh, has been uh, for many centuries. There are uh, temples of uh, so-called 10,000 uh, bodhisattvas, generally 100 or more. But uh, somehow that, that realist, uh, realistic stream uh, moved to Japan and stayed there while it really wasn't preserved in China as a dominant motif. Um, do you have any thoughts on why that m might have been, the, 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 a greater conservatism in Chinese uh, and sort of indigenous Han sculpture? Uh, sort of what, what made that a, a somewhat of a dead end uh, in mainstream uh, Chinese art? I honestly don't know, but um, after the Mongol invasions, um, although the Mongols were very um, respectful of both Buddhism and Chinese culture, um, the dominant uh, branch of Buddhism in the north was Tibetan rather than Zen. And if if you go if you go to the uh, the northeastern part of China today, and you look at the temples, the you c the architectural tradition is Tibetan rather than anything else. Um, my mentor, Peter Lam, is uh, hopeful that excavations in Inner Mongolia will produce more of the examples of the, um, the stoneware realism than we've so far found, but uh, who knows. Hi, Tony. It is. Hi, Renee. Thank, Thank you for, for your footnote. Talk. Um, I was just wanted to propose that maybe the what strikes us most when we look at them, and what makes them really unique, is the fact they're so realistic, as you were saying. Um, but it may not have been the taste of people in that time. I mean, it's so unique, and then there are no others. Is it possible that perhaps um, in their day, um, and by Chinese or, or Liao, that uh, it was not necessarily considered the greatest art. And maybe that's something that we see in our eyes from our perception in a different time with a different um, sentiment, uh, um, sentiment. But in their day, it might have been considered vulgar or, um, or perhaps you know, it, the fact that it was never mentioned is, is some great art. Isn't that possible that it wasn't necessarily seen as great art in the day? I think you may well be right. Um, the Chinese scholar Jin Shen uh, pinpoints the way in which North and South diverged between realism and stylized um, to the um, uh, the Mist and Cloud Grotto in Hangzhou, where there are a couple of really quite striking stone sculptures of Lohan. Uh, 
And he, he thinks that that's the point where North and South went their separate ways. And the South followed the, um, the style of the Guanxu um, caricatures. And they, they were a hit, there's no doubt about it. These weird and wonderful caricatures of people with drooping jowls and long eyebrows and the rest of it. They were a hit. And, uh, you know, working through to the reign of the Qianlong Emperor, you know, he had them reproduced for his own private study. So the, the non-Liao China, which became a, was eventually reunited, um, what was admired there was the Guangxu tradition rather than this, as you put it, vulgar realist tradition. So you may well be right. Yes. There's a question here. Do you have a microphone? Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the comprehensive talk. Uh, my question is about um, whether it is a common consensus that the, all these 10 Luohans actually belong to the same group. Uh, because you mentioned earlier the one from Japan is actually slightly slanted. It's not straight at all. And since you think it is from a royal patronage, so I wonder if a slanted Luohan will be accepted like... Uh, or they should remake a better one? <laughs> Very good question. I, I honestly don't know. But um, when, uh, as an example, when the one which is now in the Gimei turned up in uh, 1998, uh, the first comments were that the glaze was somehow different from the, uh, the brown and yellow and green of the rest of the group. And various people expressed doubt as to whether this was a genuine one and even if it was part of the group. Well, the, the test done on the clay demonstrated, yes, it was from the same kiln, the same time, and so on. Um, there's always going to be variations in the kiln, and that includes variations in the glaze, the way it turns out. And I think some of the sort of the green hair on the heads of the, the original heads is a case in point. Maybe it wasn't supposed to be green, uh, but that's how it turned out. Um, I would, I would argue that the, never, never mind the, the pointy pixie head on the Cezanne, um Lohan. I think looking at the rest of that uh, posture, uh, it may have slanted in the kiln, but I think it's definitely part of the same set. Uh, the, the costuming in all of them, is, is, to me it's fascinating. The postures for all of them are different. The hands are different. The garments are the same, but they're subtly different. Uh, they're all of a piece. Uh, Tony, I think we're getting a bit of the high sign uh, that um, we need to move to the book signing and book sales <laughs> part of this evening. Uh, if there are no more questions, I just want to thank Tony for a, a wonderful experience reading his book and uh, even more tonight listening to your insights and um, I, I complete I encourage all of you to uh, to buy the to buy the book here or wait for it to come out in ebook form which Graham tells me it will it is already it's on Kindle already um, I don't know I have a lot of my books on Kindle um, but thank you so much uh, can we give Tony a round of applause Could I ask you also to give a round of applause to Edith, because Edith was the person who discovered that um, my original article for the OCS had not yet been published, and introduced me to Graham Earnshaw of Earnshaw Books. Without Edith's introduction, 